I think we're probably good to good to publish it and get going. So okay. uh, I'm gonna Great. do that. Thank so. you. I'll use the opportunity to introduce Jessica Bickford um, from Healthy Lamoille Valley, our coordinator, and I'm Allison Link, Policy and Community Outreach Coordinator. We also have Ashley Hill, our new youth coordinator, um, who's been on board in a new position since March. Um, Jessica and Ashley will be helping out with our tech tonight. And I also want to say that this event is co-sponsored by Healthy Lamoille Valley, our local substance misuse prevention coalition, which is a program of the Lamoille Family Center and the Lamoille County Planning Commission. And we have more information on our websites, but I do want to ask Seth Jensen from LCPC, who's been a great partner in planning this event, to come on and just say a couple of words. Seth, if you can unmute yourself and. Sure. So thank you, Allison. Um, thank you, everyone, for um, joining us tonight. Um, want to just uh, start by saying that, as always, um, LCPC is available um, to provide uh, planning and technical assistance to communities in Lamoille County. Um, our board and LCPC in general, um, you know, as, as usual, are not taking a uh, position um, on the larger issue of legalization or the specific bills. Uh, in, in the legislature, what we're really here to do is um, provide assistance to communities and help answer your questions um, about what tools uh, may be available or um, what considerations uh, your communities might have as you're making decisions um, about what is a fairly new and emerging uh, topic. Um, so I want to be also uh, clear that part of what we are hoping to hear from you uh, tonight is what your questions um, are going to be. We may not have all of the answers uh, this evening as some of these discussions are um, still evolving. Um, but as with anything, um, it will be uh, important for communities to um, be proactive um, and know what tools and considerations are available for them uh, as they plot their course in whatever uh, direction they uh, end up choosing to go to. Great, thank you so much, Seth, and thanks for collaborating on this. So I'm glad to see so many people that are taking an interest tonight, and you can see that by the poll and the folks who keep chiming in. We are going to, after the introductions, we are gonna close off the chat piece during the presentation, just so that you know. So if you wanna introduce yourself in the chat box, this is the time. So a few notes on framing and intention here. Um, surely this is very timely, um, even as the committee on, of conference on S54 uh, was meeting today um, in our legislature, or we shall we say on, on Zoom or virtual. Um, we want folks to know a few things, and I'll echo what Seth said. We, ultimately, we want to know how we can best support our local towns, not just related to youth cannabis misuse, but all youth substance misuse. And that takes a variety of stakeholders at the table, um, like we see who are here tonight and e even a broader uh, group of stakeholders. Uh, we know that cannabis legislation is a controversial topic and we are not having that conversation tonight. So we wanna be clear that this event's lens is that of considerations for towns um, through the lens of preventing youth substance misuse and the potential individual and community level impact. And we hope that one thing that we can all agree on is that it is a good thing to prevent substance misuse of youth. So first to put, a, um, you, you have the agenda, but first we'll hear from our pre presenters from Colorado, and then we'll hear from Michelle Salvador, our local substance misuse prevention specialist. And that will be followed by a Q&A with our local municipal experts, Seth Jensen and Gwyn Zakov from um, the Vermont League of Cities and Towns. And I know we also have state legislators and lo local municipal leaders here and lots of other folks. So we look forward to hearing your voice um, as well through the, um, the Q&A uh, section of the uh, Zoom as well as during that time frame, and you can ask questions throughout and we hope our panelists will be able to respond throughout the entire event. 
So again, our focus here is how can we support our local towns? What can our town start to consider and talk about at this time in particular? What information and data will they want to gather and who can towns bring to the table to engage in conversation? Surely there's a lot more information to gather than what we're gonna present and what our presenters will present and share here tonight. And we encourage folks to seek that out. So we hope this conversation will help get people thinking about a variety of topics and what to look for in amended legislation and, and as it uh, will come out. We hope that this event encourages towns to be proactive rather than reactive. Um, and I know Seth um, had echoed that in his earlier comments. So some topics that will be included tonight but not limited to are health and mental health impact, impact on local services, local tax options, different tiers of cannabis control, retail, cultivation, processing, distribution, and others. I think there are now six potential ones that are being discussed at the legislative level. Um, we'll be talking about social, environmental, and racial justice and how that plays in, community risk factors, and as well as protective factors, education and prevention, digging into and seeking out data, trends, and of course, the evidence-based strategies. So as we get started, let's just breathe, take your bio breaks when you need them, get a cup of water, um, settle into your space. And let's just remember that the goal of prevention is not to eliminate consumption of sale of substances, but rather to assure that we are not contributing to the factors that lead towards youth misuse in our communities. So this for sure takes collaboration. We're glad to have you all here with us because we all can play a role. And so without um, further ado, I'd like to introduce Dr. Brad Roberts, um, emergency medicine uh, medical doctor from Pueblo, Colorado. Uh, he's, he, you might've been on in March when he was actually here in Lamoille County uh, speaking about cannabis and youth and we invited him um, back here to give a quick recap of what he presented back then. So I'll hand it over to Brad. All right, um, I'll just show, I'll turn off the video shortly, but just so you all know who I am. Hi, Brad Roberts. And I'll turn off the video after that uh, going forward. Allison, can you just give me a thumbs up? You can hear me okay and that the audio video things is working. Yeah. We got you. I just, uh, I'm happy to be here, happy to be here again. I'm, I'm thankful for the chance to present to you guys. Hopefully this is helpful for you. Um, just before, Jessica, if you mind going back to the first slide, I, I just saw Allison to give me about an extra 30 seconds. Um, I'm condensing a presentation that was originally about an hour long presentation into about 15 to 20 minutes. So there are things that are gonna be kind of quick that we'll gloss over. But I wanted to start on this first slide just to demonstrate kind of why we're here and why maybe people from Pueblo were talking. Uh, introduction to Pueblo. Pueblo is a, a town uh, or about 150,000 people, uh, metropolitan area, um, depending on what you include. Uh, once upon a time, our government wanted to uh, bring cannabis in, and, and a big part of that is we used to be a, a primarily a steel mill town. Uh, and this is just my take, but it went, once uh, the steel mill jobs significantly declined, and we needed a replacement for our economy. And one of our county commissioners really opted to bring cannabis in as, as one of the main industries that we would do for our economy and, and actually dubbed our community the Napa Valley of Cannabis. Um, and I happen to work in the emergency department here. Um, this is my hometown. This is where I grew up. Uh, I left for about 13 years doing all of my schooling and then came back home. Uh, and I work in an emergency department that actually is right across the street from one of our uh, cannabis concentrate manufacturers. Um, and so it's a really unique environment to work in with a very high volume of cannabis related things that, that we do see in the emergency department. Okay, next slide. Um, I wanted to start off, uh, and one more thing on that, on that past slide actually, I did um, write a, I was asked to write a paper so that legalized cannabis in Colorado emergency departments, if you wanna see a lot of the, the uh, references and so forth with this, you are, you are free to uh, Google that. It comes up, it was published in the Western Journal of Emergency Medicine and that has you know, 120 some references with everything I'll talk about here was a, a paper I published earlier. Um, so next slide, um, I started off with a timeline um, and I think that's important as we talk about it because there's gonna be a lot of inflection points. Uh, this is a timeline for what happened in Colorado, um, which you can read there. I won't read the entirety of the slide to you, but the important number that I think is in between this 2010 to 2012, and you'll see that that's when our number of patients who uh, 
were registered with the Colorado Department of Public Health for medical cannabis rose from about 5,000 in 2009 to 119,000 in 2011. So that's really, I think, the, the date or the inflection point that you should look at it is right then when that change actually took place. Go ahead and go next slide. Next slide, yeah. So these uh, are just a look at, uh, sorry, back slide. These are just a look at timelines. Um, these are from SAMHSA. Just looking at cannabis use by age and by year. And again, you'll see uh, on that slide on the left, this is Colorado looking at the 2011 timeframe. That's kind of when our rates went up, particularly on the 18 to 25 year old uh, group. Um, and again, actually our older group as well, that 26 and older group uh, had substantial increases in use. And just a comparative state uh, next door, Kansas, uh, did not go the legalization route and actually didn't see those same changes that we did in Colorado. So certainly a difference I believe occurred with legalization and use rates. Uh, next slide. So um, you can go ahead and go through all of these bullet points here. Um, and I think there's a couple more. The uh, actual adverse effects of cannabis, again, these are well reviewed in the, the paper that I was asked to write for the Western Journal of Emergency Medicine. Um, I'm gonna highlight four of them and if you'll click one more, Jessica. Um, psychosis, uh, suicide, and then we'll specifically talk about links to other substance abuse and, and end with cannabinoid hyperemesis syndrome. There are some things I'm going to highlight here that we won't fully talk about. So the adverse effects on brain structure, um, certainly some increasing data that young people in particular have uh, decreases in neurogenesis, so decreases ability uh, to form new neurons. Um, Skipping down past the kind of arrows that are drawn in there, uh, certainly increases in poor respiratory outcomes, so increases in pneumonia and asthma exacerbations. It's a little bit different than the tobacco world. Tobacco world, we seem to see a lot more of COPD, and we don't, don't seem to see that as much with cannabis. Um, but one of the things that we do see is these cardiovascular outcomes, and there's increasing data that it may increase your, your clotting cascade, which can lead to increased risk of uh, myocardial infarction or, or a heart attack and strokes. Um, if you use it during pregnancy, there is some association with a low birth weight, uh, preterm labor, uh, developmental delays in the baby. Um, and then a lot of this stuff, I think, gets talked about more, but the uh, decreases the ability to operate a motor vehicle and increases in motor vehicle collision. One of the things that I was not prepared to see that I have seen more and more is burn injuries. So people are using butane uh, as, a, as an ability to extract cannabis and are trying this just looking at YouTube videos at home. And there's been a lot of explosions um, in like backyard sheds. Uh, we've, I've had a couple of patients who have had very severe burn injuries and had to be flown flight for life up to Denver um, and have had significant skin grafts and uh, time in the ICU as a result of the burn injuries. And then there's a lot of other things that uh, we won't even touch base here, but looking at pediatric exposures, contaminants, so things like heavy, metal, heavy metals and pesticides. Um, there's a new kind of, just fairly new out there, the epigenomics, in other words, does, are some of these actually affecting the genome and there's increasing data that that may be the case. But going forward, again, I'm going to highlight those four with the arrows there, uh, psychosis, suicide, links to other substance abuse, and cannabinoid hyperemesis syndrome, and really choosing, choosing those because that's what I feel I see a lot in the emergency department. That's where a lot of the, the immediate impacts to me and my daily practice come in. Go ahead and go next slide. So this paper was a paper by Dr. Wang. Um, it was out of the University of Colorado Healthcare System, actually out of our children's hospital. So we looked at emergency department and urgent care visits of uh, adolescents uh, between the ages of 13 and 21. And a couple of things, so he polled them for ICD-10 codes that were related to marijuana. Um, and a couple of things you'll pull out of this. So first off, you can see the increasing rates again, right around that 2010, 2011 timeframe significant increase in the rates of people who are coming in with cannabis related visits. But the second thing you'll notice is that gray bar next to them. And that's showing how many of those visits, what percentage wise got a behavioral health evaluation. And you can pretty easily see it's more than 50% um, of those people who came in were actually getting a behavioral health evaluation as part of their visit. Uh, go ahead and go to the next slide. So this is out of that same paper. And what he looked at here, as you can see at the top, he looked at out of all of their total visits. So they had 7,432,254 visits from 2011 through September of 2015. And then he separated those out by diagnostic codes and included those um, with and without a marijuana related code and tried to see what the corresponding, you know, what seemed to correspond with cannabis use or marijuana use as a result. And what you'll see is that mental illness had this prevalence ratio of uh, 5.03, so about five times for the, the mental illness associated with cannabis. 
didn't see another correlation really, but, but a heavily, again, influence on the mental illness portion of that. Go ahead and go to the next slide. Um, and I, I'm not going to do a ton of these because, again, I think we're out of time. Um, but just an example, this is one I saw fairly on when I started seeing cannabis-related cases. A 22-year-old came into the emergency department. Uh, he had been brought in after a person at the hotel he was staying at uh, reportedly had got him out of the room after he tried to hang himself by a ceiling fan with his bed sheet. Uh, the manager had called 911 and EMS brought him in. Uh, the patient told me that he had been smoking weed all day every day in the motel room and that he was now seeing ghosts that were telling him to kill himself. This gentleman had no previous psychiatric history, no other medical problems, and the only relevant finding on a full kind of laboratory and, and analysis was a urine drug screen positive for cannabis. Go ahead and go next slide. Uh, another case, this was an 18-year-old male. He had been smoking marijuana at an inspirational camp prior to going to play football in a Division I college football scholarship. He had uh, oddly just immediately left the uh, conference and drove his car. He was driving about 100 miles an hour until one of his relatives, actually a cousin, had chased after him. Fortunately, the car had somehow broken down and he caught up to him on the side of the road and they uh, brought him back in. Um, I saw him out at one of our emergency departments where he was just had this completely nonsensical speech, uh, was not able to answer any of the questions I asked him. Uh, he was eventually admitted to our inpatient psychiatric treatment. Um, and even just following up on what happened about a week after, they still were having difficulty getting him to keep his clothes on. Uh, his only positive finding on anything was a urine drug screen positive for cannabis. Um, and just to make sure we're fully fair and clear, he, he was also stating that he had possibly been using mushrooms recently as well and been dealing with some anxiety type issues, but no family history of psychiatric or other, other similar problems previous. Next slide. So I have had cases like this uh, on, on a daily basis. In fact, I, I'm still in scrubs. You can see I got home about 15 minutes before I was supposed to give this presentation. And that was actually the last thing I left was a similar presentation just today. Um, I haven't seen I hadn't seen cases like this until about that 2011 time frame. Um, their urine drug screens are only positive for marijuana. Um, they have, generally speaking, have no previous psychiatric history. To me, it seems to span age ranges, gender, ethnicity, socioeconomic stance, uh, circumstances. Um, the one unifying thing is that all of them have a urine drug screen positive for cannabis. Go ahead and go to the next slide. I found it interesting as I was seeing these and contemplating this, uh, a lot of the, the music out there does recognize this. One of my favorite songs by Green Day, um, one of the key lines is, am I just paranoid or am I just stoned? Certainly paranoia is one of the, the well-recognized uh, effects of using cannabis. And I think the psychosis episodes are kind of on the spectrum of that paranoia. Um, this isn't just me that's seeing this. Uh, basically, every major review that's looked at cannabis has come to the same conclusion. So whether we look at the National Academies of Sciences and Engineering paper that came out, the World Health Organization, or we had actually our own uh, statewide independent review that from the Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment, they all independently came to the same conclusion. Uh, I included the quote here from the National Academies paper that there is substantial evidence of a statistical association between cannabis use and the development of schizophrenia or other psychoses with the highest risk among the most frequent users. Go ahead and go to the next slide. Um, unfortunately, one of the big things that we've also seen is increased rates of suicide. Um, go ahead to the next slide. Suicide is actually our number one cause of death in Colorado for our youth, so in between the ages of 10 and 24. And since 2009, unfortunately, our children's hospital has seen the number of patients who've committed suicide, or excuse me, attempted suicide go up uh, 600%. Go ahead and go to the next slide. Certainly speaking, suicide, or certainly suicide and the reasons for suicide are multifactorial, and I wouldn't uh, attribute cannabis to all of these, but some interesting statistics. So if you look at our suicide rates over, over years, this is for all ages, not just youth, but you'll see the, a dramatic increase in the number of suicides. Kind of plotted on that same graph is the number of suicides that are positive for cannabis. Um, when I gave this presentation back in March, the uh, 2016 and 2017 data had not yet been out. Um, that has since come out, so I just included that as these two blue dots and two green dots up on top of that. And unfortunately, those numbers have continued to climb um, from our, for our statewide data. Um, and you'll see those numbers record, uh, represented on the side there. Go ahead and go to the next slide. So I wanted to know when I was kind of writing the paper on it, well, what's the actual percentage numbers look like? Sure, suicides have gone up, but so have marijuana and do suicides. What's the percentage of those look like? And so if you separate that out as a percent, just basically dividing the one number by the other, 
uh, these are the numbers you come up with looking at as a, a percent. And again, pretty rapid increase right from that 2011 inflection point. And unfortunately, uh, still continues to climb. Uh, go ahead and go to our next slide. Uh, again, this isn't just me. Um, this was the main paper that was cited by the National Academy of Science, Engineering, and Medicine. Um, they found an odds ratio of 1.43 for suicidal ideation for any cannabis use, and then that goes up for heavy cannabis use. And again, you can see those numbers for suicide attempts uh, and suicide completion. And one of the interesting things is that both of these seem to have a dose-related response. In other words, heavy users seem to be at even a higher risk of, of the non-heavy users. Go ahead and go to the next slide. This one, I feel like got hotly debated, particularly when this was first coming out in Colorado of, of how this impacts other substance use. There was certainly a lot of talk about whether or not this was a, a gateway drug. Um, I think it's complex and unfortunately I don't have time to develop, delve completely into that, but I think there is certainly a link between that. Uh, when I was going back to the, the kind of white paper literature and looking a lot on PubMed, um, I found four separate discordant twin studies. So that means twins who were identical but separated at birth that each found that the twin who used marijuana was more likely to use other substances even after controlling for their environmental and genetic influences. Go ahead and go to the next slide. I think some of the more interesting data comes out of our um, animal data. So if you look at rats that are exposed to THC, uh, they have an abnormal behavioral sensitization not only to THC but also to opiates and nicotine. And that if you look at those rat brains, there's uh, actual neuronal changes in their brains and the mesolimbic dopamine neurons, those are the ones that are involved in uh, kind of substance dependence. Um, and that they develop cross tolerance, uh, not only with cannabis, but also with morphine, amphetamines and cocaine. Another really interesting study I saw that if I, if I gave, if I took the, these same rats and I created a knockout rat, in other words, I took out their cannabinoid receptor and gave them morphine, um, it seemed to mediate the effect of the morphine. And not only that, if I gave them lots of morphine and then gave them Narcan, they didn't develop any of the same withdrawal symptoms, which again is, is fairly interesting and, and relates to, I think, that THC actually in and of itself uh, is related to other substance abuse and dependence. Go ahead, Brad, go I just want to, this is Allison, just want to yeah. give you the time check of about five minutes. And also some folks are requesting that you share your screen, that it's uh, for the presenter to share if possible, if that works for you. Not sure how your setup is. Um, also, there are some questions in the Q&A, and I know there are lots of them, so I'm not sure we can address them now, but for surely at the end, thank you everyone who is, um, who is leaving a question there for us to um, try to address, and the presenters will try to address it throughout the presentation. Why don't, Allison, I'll go ahead and, and finish uh, the way we're set up since we already have Jessica doing my slide control. I realize that is a little bit tough. Um, let's have, just finish it up as is, as opposed to me kind of emptying and starting midway through. Yes, 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 go ahead, go ahead. And then we'll take questions kind of at the end here if that's okay. Let's go ahead yeah. and go to the next slide. Uh, so this is just a look. So these are over death, overdose deaths in Colorado by year uh, up through 2018, which is the latest, I, at least I have seen data for. Um, so if you look at that again, right at those inflection points, uh, 2011, uh, almost all of our substance use and abuse actually has, has increased since that time. Uh, the one, the biggest concerning ones, you'll look at our methamphetamine use has just gone uh, significantly up. I think that's actually gone up nationwide, but again, substantially substantial increases here in uh, Colorado. And then similar with our heroin numbers, um, also our cocaine, fentanyl, and even our prescription opiates um, have actually also continued to rise. Go ahead and go to the next slide. Um, these are actually from my hospital, so the Parkview Medical Center, that's where I work. So if you look at our census uh, patients, so you'll see uh, our total number of drug screens uh, actually stayed pretty similar, but uh, had significant increases uh, both in total and then for cannabis, opiates, and amphetamines all had significant increases in rates. So again, you can, you can see the numbers there, but that's from our local hospital here. Uh, next slide. Um, cannabinoid hyperemesis syndrome. So I believe now this is not as under-recognized as it used to be, um, but just in case, so what that means is people get this significant nausea violent vomiting and abdominal pain, and usually in the setting of chronic cannabis use. Um, historically, they used to always state that the symptoms got better with hot showers, and so that's still one of the diagnostic criteria. Although, to be honest, I've, I've seen this so often lately that I, I'm a little less uh, asking about the hot showers thing. It's, it's pretty common that we'll see very similar patients. Um, if you actually look at some of the studies that came out following legalization here in Colorado, 
Colorado, uh, there was about a, about a two-fold increase in people coming in with cyclic vomiting presentations. Uh, oftentimes, these people just look miserable. Um, they come in and they're, they're, they actually call it scrometing here, which is a combination of screaming and vomiting. They're just retching, um, vomiting recurrently. Um, and so a lot of times they get fairly large evaluations. They, we get imaging studies, we get lab work. Sometimes they get admitted to the hospital because we can't get them to stop vomiting and they'll go for endoscopy and so forth. Um, unfortunately, a lot of our typical treatments for nausea and vomiting have not been found to be very effective. Um, and I'm can, happy to talk about this further, but what I've personally found is that uh, Haldol um, it, or benzodiazepines such as Valium are generally speaking uh, m the best agents. I know there's been some talk about capsaicin cream and other things, but for the most part, that's what, the, what has worked for me. Um, go ahead and go to the next slide. This is looking at our hospital data for cannabinoid hyperemesis syndrome. So I, was, I did this study with some of our residents here that, and our GI fellows that were looking at uh, endoscopy findings is, is actually what we were looking at. So people who weren't for endoscopy with cannabinoid hyperemesis syndrome, we wanted to see if there were findings there. But as part of that, this is our total number of cannabinoid hyperemesis patients by year from our hospital. So you see just uh, dramatic increases there. Next slide. And this is a paper that talked about how much this cost. Um, just you'll see the highlighted there. Uh, this was looking at 17 different patients at a, at a separate hospital, but they found that uh, the cost was about $76,920 per patient on average. Go ahead and go to the next slide. Um, you know, Allison wanted to, me to talk a little bit about things that I had seen and, and didn't expect. And I'll tell you, when this first came to Colorado, um, the we were promised a lot of things. This would not be near schools. There would be no advertising. This would be fairly limited. And it's progressed uh, fairly regularly and still progressing. So this is what we are now dealing with as of, as of right this moment. Um, our color, the Colorado legislature passed House Bill 19 and what this looks at, or 191230, what you're seeing there. And this now is that we're, we're going to pass, or, or it has passed at the state level for marijuana hospitality lounges. Or, or spaces, and what that means is you can use uh, cannabis in public or uh, in clubs. Uh, and it's interesting, once upon a time here in Pueblo, we were fairly proud that we were one of the first places in the nation to actually eliminate indoor uh, smoking and actually demonstrated significant improvements on our cardiovascular outcomes and we were able to publish a nice study in the, in the Journal of American, uh, the American Medical Association, or JAMA. Unfortunately, this is now going to be an exception to the Colorado Clean Indoor Air Act. Air Act. So you can't smoke cigarettes, but you can smoke cannabis in uh, public spaces. Brad, I do want to let you know that we've got a, like a one minute kind of uh, timing to then move on a bit. So if we can move towards okay. wrapping. We, we're just about done here. Great. So this is, we're also developing vending machines here. Go ahead and go to the next slide. Uh, again, this is looking at cost. So um, one of the th it's rare that we find good papers to look at cost, but this was an interesting paper that looked at cost and they found for about every dollar that was gained in tax revenue, we spent about $4.50 to mitigate the effects of legalization. Next slide. Um, and I just wanted to end with, you know, this is a difficult topic. We all want to be able to treat hard to treat diseases, chronic pain, mental illness, multiple sclerosis. Those are things that we've We've looked at cannabis as a possible treatment for, and I am certainly not opposed to doing that. Um, I want to be able to do the best medical treatment for my patients and help them so that they don't have any further suffering, um, no matter what that substance might be. Uh, we want people, fewer people dependent on substances. Um, I think racism uh, is deplorable, and we should do everything we can to eliminate that. Um, Low-level drug offenses probably need a different way to be handled in our legal system. And you know, every community is looking for money, um, funding to be able to fund their schools, their roads, public health measures, and to try to lower people's healthcare costs. Um, go ahead, next, next bullet point. But from what I've seen in Colorado, I don't think that our, our for-profit marijuana industry has helped uh, those categories, and it's unfortunately probably worse than most of them. Go ahead and go to the next slide. This should be the end of my presentation. Thank you very much. Brad, Dr. Roberts, thank you so much. Um, I think just based on our time, we'd love for you to check out the Q&A. Um, folks are asking about a CDC study that came out six days ago and some other um, impact questions and even towards um, 
research on THC versus CBD use. And if you could then, if, if you're able to address them, whatever you are at this moment, if you can put responses in the chat box so that everybody can see it. So you don't have to respond in the Q&A, but to respond in the chat box to all the panelists and all of the participants, that would be great. And folks continue to ask in the Q&A because we're really hoping that we can get answers to, your, to questions um, live and, and during the session. But if we can't, then we want to be able to follow up and make sure that we do our research to be able to support um, the, the conversation continuing and, and answering any questions you have. So I'd like to now um, move towards our public health and policy experts from Pueblo, Colorado, um, essentially um, some counterparts to our Healthy the Moyle Valley folks here in Vermont. And so Sarah Martinez and Scott Shuley, if you can introduce yourselves and, and looking forward to hearing from you. Thanks, Allison. And it would be helpful. Is it possible for you to use video? We had a couple a comment about if you can see presenters. I know it's a little tricky, but um, yeah. and also folks feel free to to um, to add your thoughts in the Q and A. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. Welcome. Welcome. Thanks, Allison. Um, so, like Allison said, my name is Sarah Martinez, and with me today I have my colleague Scott Shuley. Um, and we are really kind of the public health lens to Dr. Roberts' medical health lens today. Um, and so we're going to be providing some lessons learned and some insight post marijuana legislation from a public health and prevention lens today. Um, but before we get started, I just wanted to say that we, Scott and I, are by no means lobbyists. Um, we, be, we will be presenting some quantitative and qualitative data today. But um, it's really just about our, our lived experience as living here in Pueblo, Colorado, post the legislation of marijuana. And so uh, my name is Sarah. I use she, a, uh, pronouns. Um, I um, am a community mobilizer specialist. And I'm actually a backbone of a youth substance use coalition here in Pueblo, Colorado. Um, I have about four years of public health experience. And interestingly enough, I was born and raised in this community. Um, so it's a really cool experience to not only um, have the insight of growing up as a young person here in Pueblo, but now having the opportunity to impact systems for young people um, in public health. And with me today, I have Scott. Yeah, so I'm Scott Shuley. Uh, my pronouns he, him, his. Um, <clears throat> I've been working in public health uh, it, for just about nine years, working in tobacco prevention education. Um, so helping pass uh, smoke-free policies, making sure that uh, things are kind of aligned so people aren't penalized or so much held um, to a standard where they're being scrutinized or held at question. Basically trying to put policies forward that help everyone, um, you know, enjoy the, the great spaces that we have in Pueblo to offer. So a little bit about the town that we come from. Um, Pueblo, Colorado is, is located in southeastern Colorado. If you think about Colorado as being really the midpoint of Colorado or of, um, of America, Pueblo is kind of the southeastern quadrant of Colorado in the state. So we are their little red um, rectangle there. Um, our population is approximately 160,000 in the whole county. Um, and about half of that population identifies it with Latinx um, ethnicity. Um, but regardless of racial and ethnic um, demographics, our average household income is below fe federal poverty level line at $36,000. And because of the demographics of our county, as well as kind of the overall layout, we are classified as a rural county in Colorado. In terms of government, the Pueblo City is really governed by a strong mayoral system with seven council members that acts as kind of his advisors. They do have legislative powers, um, but really it's this mayoral, mayoral system and the strong mayor who um, has the power to um, adopt and oversee all of the legislation. The county itself is governed by three county commissioners that represent diff three different districts of our county um, and their constituents. Um, 
and so that's kind of our political landscape that we're living in right now. Um, and Colorado is, Nate calls us the Napa Valley of weed. Um, that's a lot of the nicknames that we hear across the state. Um, we are considered the Napa Valley of weed. And so we will get into kind of the impacts of that perception here in just um, a couple minutes. So we can go ahead and move on to the next slide. And then just to address um, one of the questions in the comment box, um, we're gonna be using the word marijuana just because in the terms for our legislation in Colorado, that's how it's been referred to as. So please understand that we do use, um, even though we don't use cannabis interchangeably, we are speaking from the terms of the way the laws are written within our state and our community. Um, so just to give a timeline of how marijuana was legalized within Colorado and within Pueblo, you can kind of see that timeline here of when medical started. And then as Dr. Roberts kind of mentioned, it was quite some time before um, Colorado adopted a statewide code. And then we have retail marijuana that passed in 2014. And now we have, as uh, Dr. Roberts alluded to, these hospitality establishments so and marijuana delivery systems what these things do is sarah mentioned our political landscape within pueblo county um, that is our statutory rural uh, county so they basically follow anything that's a state law they don't really implement a lot of their own laws or policies without the state's approval and go ahead pueblo city um, led by the mayor and city council is more of our home rule city so we can make a lot of our own policies and procedures around things that we'll talk about a little bit more in detail. We can go to the next slide please. So we're going to talk about impacts on our community and speaking on behalf of our systems we're going to talk a little bit about law enforcement. Sarah will touch on public health and then I'll kind of wrap it in with planning and zoning. But with law enforcement, what we're kind of seeing within our community specifically is that even though it's legal in the state, it is still federally illegal. So a lot of things happen within our community around that um, possession, usage, things like that. We do see higher rates of driving under the influence um, with the in inability to have accurate in the field testing if that should happen when a police officer pulls someone over and has suspect or anything like that. They, don't, they can't tell if they were just exposed to it or um, things like that. So we don't have access to those tests at this point. And it doesn't, it hasn't slowed down the black and gray markets uh, within our community just because it's legalized. A lot of the businesses have to have pretty significant amount of capital overhead to have their own dispensaries or things like that. So it still pushes our lower socioeconomic communities to grow and distribute their own and not go through the proper channels. In terms of public health, um, one of the major impacts that we're seeing um, for public health is kind of a, a really large gap of evidence-based research around what um, regular sustained cannabis use does on the body, um, on secondhand smoke, and overall systemic effects around cannabis use and community impacts. The, a lot of the research that Dr. Roberts presented is in press, um, it, or it was just published, it's hot off the presses. And in public health, we drive our decisions based off of data. And so when there's a lack of data, we struggle to make really strong evidence-based decisions. Um, another really big impact on public health is that there's been um, a need to redirect some capacity to inspect retail and med medical marijuana facilities. Um, so prior to legislation, our inspectors didn't really um, inspect retails or grows or cultivators. Now when they do, um, they're, they, they are exposed to cannabis in the field, whether, whether that be in a retail grow um, or out um, in a shop, and they come back smelling like cannabis. And so there's kind of a, um, a struggle right now and how, do, how if, a, in a, if an inspector is um, smelling like cannabis use um, and in uniform, how like where's the line there and, and how are we navigating that? So that's kind of an unforeseen impact on local systems in terms of public health, in addition to a lack of evidence-based. And then to kind of wrap up this slide with city planning and zoning, some of the things that we experience within our community is um, 
one of the things is marijuana grows, cannabis grows, dispensaries. They had the same zoning fee as some of our um, specialized child care facilities. And that's just because the way it was written in Pueblo's code when it was hurried up and legalized and they didn't know where to put it. So they put it within the same process. And that's actually a huge win that our community has had is we were able to reevaluate that and then change where that uh, child care um, process and licensing went. Limitations on grows. Um, this is specifically within our county because, again, this was hurried and passed um, without a lot of oversight and people looking into it. But basically, what happened was you had um, grows within the way the um, policy was written was it had to be within, say, a hundred feet or as, let's say a thousand feet of a building. So some of these times the building of the grow was within a thousand feet of the house nearby but it wasn't necessarily um it was causing a lot of issues they were getting too close to prop it, so what they did it was they changed it to a, from the property line rather than from structure um and then this eliminated some of that proximity distance that a lot of our families who live in our rural area of pueblo county were experiencing we can progress to the next slide please so here we'll talk a little bit about the impacts on the economy. Um, within Colorado, um, when we did pass this, a lot of the banks weren't able to take the money since it wasn't federally funded yet, uh, federally legal. Um, and then we also have some experience with when smoke-free public housing happened, HUD is, the housing authority follows what's federally legal. So you have a lot of tenants who are being put in um, a tough spot because if they use it medically or even for recreationally and our law allows them to grow um, they could be in trouble with uh, violating their lease agreement through hud and then you can kind of read that last part about where our funds go for marijuana within the state of colorado at a local level they did pass uh, some of it to go to scholarships to help go through um, universal studies so Next slide. Yeah, it was all funneled to higher education. So I think that, that was a really cool win. Um, in terms of um, young people, there are several impacts in terms of youth marijuana use. So this data is from Healthy Kids Colorado Survey, which is administered in middle schools and high schools all over the state of Colorado, and it's self-report. Um, and Pueblo County is number seven. It's the brightest green um, rectangle there. And we are the highest youth usage in the whole state of Colorado. Um, and it's not necessarily um, a surprise. We've always been the highest, though it has, there has been a steadily an uptick in youth marijuana use. Um, in terms of how they are ingesting marijuana, a lot of um, our young people are self-disclosing that they smoke it instead of eating or dabbing, which we know can cause a little bit more adverse uh, side effects and health effects. Next slide, please. Um, so I, so um, I actually cross-tabulated a lot of the data from Healthy Kids Colorado survey to see the interaction between several risk factors and marijuana use. So um, from that data, and this is all for high school students, from that data, we see that youth, um, youth that use marijuana, 50% of them are regularly carrying a weapon at school, and 57% have attempted suicide in the last year. Um, in terms of protective factors, things that we want young people to experience, um, only, a quarter of, or only a quarter of young people who are regularly using marijuana have a trusted adult to talk to. Um, and interestingly enough, only 7% think that underage use is wrong. So there's a lot of opportunities for um, misperception and um, correcting some social norming things, which I'll get to in just a minute. Sarah, I just wanted to mention about five minutes left of your Perfect. presentation. Thanks, Great. Allison. So uh, here we're gonna look at the social impacts on social determinants of health. What we see is this does impact our food system slightly. A lot of the times people within our community, the families overlook um, being able to provide food just so they can get marijuana. So we do live in a very, a lot of our schools are Title IX funded, so they receive a lot of free and reduced lunch programs. Um, so that's a concern for us. And then what, as I kind of mentioned within that, it, it, you have to have a lot of capital overhead to have a business. Um, 
that's where a lot of this cannabis and marijuana starts to take impact on our community is these individuals move here and they want to improve the neighborhoods and then if a grower dispensary comes in that neighborhood then the people who want to improve that neighborhood don't have the capital overhead to filter that money back into their community and then to address homelessness what we have is um, a lot of people came to colorado and pueblo because of our low cost of living in hopes that they would be able to get a job and because of the um, responsibilities that it takes to own a cultivation and grow site and a dispensary a lot of times these uh, employees have already been selected deeply vetted so the individuals who moved here don't have money to get anywhere else so we have an increased homeless population we can move to the next slide so um, kind of moving on to what we've done to mitigate some of the impacts we have a lot of smoke-free protections. As Dr. Roberts mentioned, we have our smoke-free air ordinance that passed in Pueblo, one of the first in the state of Colorado. Um, Colorado Clean Indoor Air followed a few years later. They recently amended it um, to allow for exemptions, as Dr. Roberts alluded to, allowing for marijuana consumption inside if the community opted into the um, hospitality facility. So that would be something the community would have to do. Um, so that's why we have a local coalition kind of looking into these things to figure out if we want our community, if the community's best interest is to opt in or opt out. And then if they do opt in, what does that look like? How do we protect people from exposure, uh, workers, employees, um, even people within uh, the building, as well as how do we keep these things distanced from schools, um, not normalizing that use and that behavior. We can move to the next slide, please. In terms of a youth substance use prevention perspective, there's a lot of efforts right now really around reinforcing the best practices around prevention in the community. That looks like increasing the amount of pro-social opportunities for young people to engage in, and that's a best practice recommended by the CDC. Um, there's lots of statewide and local campaigns that's around social norming. Um, so really focusing in on, you know, seven, even though 25% of young people are using marijuana regularly, 75% aren't. So like, that's a, that's a huge win for us. Um, and then really about leveraging youth voice and choice here in our community. So hiring more youth advisors, um, uh, promoting positive youth development, things like that. Um, and can you go to the next, we're just going to, next slide, and then just, we're going to go to the next slide because I think that that's a little bit more salient. Um, the next slide, yeah. So looking forward, um, there's a couple of questions that we want to just, we want to just pose to your community or hope that you think of, um, of these questions when you're thinking about um, being proactive to marijuana legislation in Vermont. Um, number one, how can we earmark funds and taxes for prevention or other things that our community needs? Number two, what parameters can we put in place to protect our community? Does that look like um, having zoning so that way it's um, not next to a school or a childcare facility? Um, can there be advertising restrictions so that way marijuana grows or pot shops don't, don't have the ability to immediately advertise in all of the youth-friendly magazines there are? Um, can we put in some place hospitality restrictions so that we're always preserving some smoke-free air policies? Um, how, number three, how will this change the perception of our community? In Colorado, Pueblo is known as Napa's Valley um, of Weed. So how, how can um, Vermont communities get ahead of that perception problem? Number four, does our community still get federally funded programs? And if so, how are we going to navigate that? How are we going to navigate occupation, occupational hazards? So that way, if I work at Head Start that's federally funded um, and my urine analysis comes back hot, can I, do I still have a job? Um, and then the last question is, are we going to, how are we going to regulate and enforce? Um, and then are we going to also regulate things like grows and CBD? Um, so just some questions to think about as you're navigating this landscape. Next slide. Um, we can open up to questions or we can always um, wait until the end.
Thank you so much, Sarah and Scott, um, for all those considerations, knowing that our conversation today is specific to our local area and local towns and what they can do, but um, so appreciate sharing your insights, your, the data from Pueblo and all of your experience. Um, really appreciate it. There is a question I want to direct to you, but to direct into the Q&A that is, um, Mm -hmm. There are a couple that are related specific, specifically to um, does Colorado require businesses involved with the cultivation, processing, or sales of cannabis products to complete any education training requirements prior to being licensed or authorized? And there are some others that you may be able to address. I also mm -hmm. know that in the Q&A, we have had some of those questions answered, and I think that that is public. So I would like to see if um, if that is indeed what's happening, can folks see the answered Q and A, and maybe you can respond in the in the Q and A to let us know if you can see that. And Jessica, if we can just before Michelle goes on and we go local, can you go back to just because we're heading into the conversation and more Q and A, um, if we can go back to the norms. Uh, at the beginning of the presentation, that slide on, on norms. I just wanted to review that before we head into this section that is um, really going local and addressing our local community and, and all the questions people have that will be, folks will be able to raise their hand and unmute themselves, um, as well as, uh, you know, use the q &A. So, Allison, yeah. that's actually a lot trickier um, uh, okay. and so without so going me, through every so me, single thing. Okay, so let me, so let me read some of those off just to remind folks that um, you know use the Q&A to ask your questions and the priority of answering is going to go to local municipal leaders and then others like really focused on our towns um, you know and identify your town if you're asking a question help us facilitate this and we will try to get to all the questions and if not we'll try to address them um, in future correspondence um, obviously, we know that there are differing views and attitudes around um, cannabis, and we want to be respectful in sharing and asking questions. Um, you know, we've, we're learning from the Colorado experience. We're exploring implications for our Vermont rural towns. So that's really the focus of, of this, is that <clears throat> we want to focus on if there is a commercial market and it becomes legal, um, then what what are some considerations for towns right now and how to be proactive in thinking about those and um you know we'll hear more about that in a bit um if again if we do run out of time we're going to be posting the slides here and uh any other answers to questions on our website at healthy the valley.org um backslash marijuana that's currently a page that we have up um, this event is being recorded, and so the recording will also be available for folks. Um, it's being recorded by Hardwick Community TV and Green Mountain Access TV. So just to let you know of that, and um, obviously keep in touch with us. People are writing in the Q&A. We're trying to respond as best as, as we can. So I hope that that bit is helpful. And now I want to introduce Michelle Salvador. Um, Michelle, we had another poll to go off, and I will, uh, I will hope to, as Michelle's um, getting ready, I will find it to read verbally. Or maybe Jessica, do you have it to read verbally, or do you want me to? Or you um, can just skip it. Yeah, we're going to skip it. <laughs> okay, we'll, 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 we'll skip it. Michelle, uh, welcome. And now, folks, Thanks. we're really heading into the local, um, the local section of, of our event. Go ahead, Michelle. Yeah, sure. So I just want to say a little bit of who I am, um, Michelle Salvador. I am a um, community organizer and substance um, prevention consultant. Um, and I work for the Vermont Department of Health um, out of the Morrisville District Office. There are um, 10 of us uh, that do this work in the state. And um, we work with community members and organizations um, that are interested and concerned about substance misuse. Um, and the impact within their communities. So I just wanted to say, to begin with, that prevention is based on research. Long gone are the days of Nancy Reagan, just say no, this is your brain on drugs, et cetera. 
um, we are all based in research, and some of that research is um, from Hawkins and Catalana way back when, and it's on um, risk and protective factors. So we have been able to work to identify um, which risk factors exist within our communities and our lives that put young people at the highest risk of using early in life, and what are the factors within our community um, that protect them. So I just wanted to kind of start with that. I'm gonna share um, some of our local and state data. And hopefully my son who's screaming at his Xbox in the background isn't gonna disturb us. Um, but I, I do a lot of my work also um, from looking at the community, um, having like a really constructive eye within the community and what I'm seeing and what could the impact be? Um, what is the experience that my son is having? So I, I just give you that background to show you that um, uh, not this past summer, obviously, but I think it was the summer. So before we went to um, uh, Youth Day at the Farmer's Market, and it was right after um, um, uh, legalization. And at the Youth Market, we had, you know, um, cannabis, free cannabis at the table, and it was like gone very quickly. So um, this is some of the risk and protective factors we look at in our work are how um, what is the access and what are the availability of different substances within our community? And um, what are our community laws and norms like? What are the norms we have in our community and um, how do young people perceive those and how does that um, impact use? Uh, oh, Jessica, since you're in control. So I'm gonna start with um, some of our state and local data just to um, put some things in perspective. Uh, this shows the percentage of Vermonters, um, 12 and older, uh, using cannabis in the past month, and it is, we are consistently higher than the national average. I know um, sometimes we see some data saying that um, we're lower or rates haven't gone up, et cetera. This is, um, this is the latest and uh, greatest uh, trend data that we have. Both Vermont and U.S. have had significant increases um, contrary to um, the myth that we see a lot that it has decreased or not increased. And you can note in the data there in 2013 um, where uh, uh, cannabis was decriminalized and then um, Vermont legal possession occurred here in um, 2018. And you can you know, start seeing that where that's reflected in this data. Next slide. So um, here you can see how Vermont's past month use is higher than all of the Northeast of the United States and higher um, than the United States. Um, I think we're seeing very, the colors are very different than what the colors were on my presentation. So I had Vermont is green, but it's not. So Vermont is um, gray, the gray one, and you can see that we are higher in all age categories and Vermont ranks first in the United States for past month use of cannabis among 12 to 17 year olds and 18 to 25 year olds. And we rank second in the nation for use um, of those 26 and older. And this um, source is, you can see the sources I have um, listed at the bottom. It's from the National Survey on Drug Use and Health. Michelle, I do want to say I had apologize. I apologize for taking up some of your time. So I want to give okay. you another five minutes. Oh, um, okay. To go here. Okay. Okay. All right. Thanks. Okay. So in this slide, um, it's just an example to show how we compare to the rest of the United States. So we have similar but higher levels already as Colorado and Washington, which both have legal and commercialization already. So that's you know, something to know and, and to consider. Um, next slide. And so let's, uh, here we break it down a little bit and take a look at use among 12 to 17 year olds as compared to use among 12, 12 to 17 year olds in the United States. So the red markings indicate where we have had statistically uh, significant increases in use and the green indicates where there have been statistically significant decreases, okay? So you can see um, where 
in the United States at times, there were a, a decrease. And when we've had some um, decreases, but we've also had some increases that tend to correlate with what we have been doing um, legislatively. Again, um, we are highest in the nation. So this slide, this shows you use among all age groups in Vermont. So the percentage of Vermonters age 18 to 25, I think it comes up in orange in this slide, um, using cannabis in the past month is consistently higher than all other age groups. Um, this is important to note because the brain is not done developing until age 25. So this age group is at the highest risk of developing um, future dependency issues. Again, um, green is a statistically significant decrease in use, and red is a um, significant increase. Next slide, Jessica. So now on to some of our local data. We, um, every other year, we use the, we do the Vermont risk behavior, the YRBS, the Vermont risk behavior survey. And this is actually one of the most um, validated um, tools in existence. And um, I just wanna say that uh, we have our current results for 2019, but unfortunately because of COVID and how our work at the health department really shifted to COVID work, um, the um, getting out the local data, the state data is out, getting out the local data has not finished happening yet because we've been focused so much on the um, COVID response. Um, however, um, uh, so this 26%, we would guess when we look at how the state level data has changed, this 26% um, is, I would say it's likely low. So here is how we compare to the rest of Vermont. Um, as of 2017, and we were very similar in Lamoille County as to the rest, um, compared to the rest of the whole state. Um, uh, marijuana use during the past 30 days in the whole state, 2019, YRBS, um, significant, had a significant, a statistically significant increase from 24% in 2017 to 27% in 2019. Okay, so Jessica yes, um, no. is a little ahead of me. Oh, and um, also, Michelle, I need to say that we're going to have to move on in about a minute, and I apologize for that, but we want okay, to get to Okay, what, okay. What, the point that I want to make here is that the reason why we do this work is because the research, we know that the brain is not done developing until age 25. So the research shows us that when young people start using at an early age, and many start using by substances by the age of 13, that they are more likely to develop dependency in their life. So when we're looking at our Lamoille data, we are worse than the rest of the state. 9% um, beginning to use introduced substances, introduce marijuana before the age um, of 13. And um, next, oh, I don't know where the other piece of data went. Anyway, um, also our um, alcohol is uh, use among young people is significantly higher. Um, so um, I think uh, this, I'll just show you these slides and then I will be done. Um, there, like I told you, there are many factors that contribute to young people using at an early age. How ac the access of substances, how available they are, the perception of how harmful they think there are, and whether there are community laws and norms that support use. So when we have a lot of, like I see a lot of use at birthday parties, farmers markets, um, community events, and so. Um, Oftentimes, a lot of that messaging impacts our young people, and we can see the trend in the data that when, they're, when they perceive it to not be so harmful, then the use rates go up. When they perceive substances to be more harmful and are getting that messaging, then that early use rates go down. And that early use is what we are really focused on in prevention. So I, I would just show you this, make this one last point. Um, oh, can you go back, Jessica? So you pay attention here, you can see that here is alcohol use. So in this slide, alcohol use went down and use of marijuana um, went up. Now to the next slide. 
And then this shows young people who are getting the messaging from their parents that the parents either uh, think that use is wrong for them as a young per person or it's not. And so you can see just the exact opposite. So when alcohol use went down among young people, there was a direct correlation to their parents disapproving of the use. And when marijuana use went up among young people, there was a direct correlation to their parents um, not thinking it was as their perception that their parents think it is not problematic for them. So I think I'm out of time and um, thank you. Thank you so much, Michelle, for bringing in all of your experience as a substance misuse prevention consultant um, and bringing in the local data. So I don't wanna waste any time uh, in getting to uh, Gwyn Zakov and Seth Jensen. And I wanna just pose a question to them first and then we'll take other questions. Again, I think folks can see where their hand is that you can raise your hand to eventually ask questions of the two of them and our Pueblo folks. Um, I want to direct presenters also to, as, and Michelle, now that you're done presenting, to go into the Q&A to try to respond as we can. And um, I want to welcome Seth and Gwen, if you can appear, make yourselves appear, uh, so if you folks can see you, it would be great. I have my video on, hopefully people can see. Oh, great. Yeah, now I see you when you're speaking. Perfect. And so if you can talk about, you know, anything up to date about the legislation in Vermont that you're aware of, and what is most on your mind with respect to the potential cannabis commercialization and impact on our local rural towns, um, especially, you know, for Seth to mention in the greater Lamoille Valley, but, you know, what's most on your mind right now? And um, uh, Gwen, I see your face. So would you... Uh, would you come and sure. Talk? Sure. Um, so the legislation that's um, working through right now, which is what um, uh, I would consider in its final stages um, of passage, um, it's now in a negotiation between the Senate and the House. Um, it's what we call a committee of conference, um, where they hash out and negotiate the terms of a final bill. Um, and uh, it's a, the bill that came from the Senate was close to 60 pages. The bill that came from the House was just under 90, so there's quite a bit to go back and forth on. And so um, they, uh, as you'd said earlier, Alice, and they had a, a meeting today, um, and they still have things that they're hashing out, um, and they will meet again on Friday. And um, so this is the this is the furthest it's ever gone in the state legislature in terms of a um, a commercial market, um, a tax and regulated market. And so. Um, there's uh, a lot to know just based on the side by side of what they're um, comparing. So it's uh, you kind of know the universe you're working in, but sometimes the terms change. And interestingly enough, a lot of the terms they're debating right now that are actually of um, of uh, so, uh, there's a lot of uh, heat between the Senate and the House, or a lot of the local control issues, um, the issues of how towns go about um, allowing or not allowing um, cannabis operations in their communities, um, whether they're going to have a, an opt-in or opt-out um, vote by the uh, local voters. Um, there's obviously the huge issue of uh, uh, taxation. And then um, the other big issues uh, are basically how the, the Cannabis Control Board, which is basically what they're putting together as the state entity that's going to regulate, uh, basically set the standards and terms and administration of um, the uh, the marketplace, um, how basically the, the world that they're they're living in and sort of the, what they're gonna be able to, um, to do. So um, that's where it is right now. Um, and I think the, the, I think an interesting thing to point out to Vermonters that are paying attention to this right now is that Colorado is a really different, um, uh, it's a little bit of a civics lesson. Colorado has something where um, local communities like Pueblo have a lot of local control and they can have um, a lot of local ordinances and regulations and policies where they don't need state authority. Um, Vermont is very much the opposite. We're one of a handful of states that um, can't do anything, local governments can't do anything unless they're granted authority by the legislature first. So um, this is, that, that's, that creates a bit of a problem in terms of, I, I would, you know, I get calls a lot from um, communities wanting answers about what 
what to expect. And I have no, not too many of them because um, we're um, waiting to hear um, what the legislation looks like. And then thereafter, what the Cannabis Control Board puts in place in terms of, in terms of sort of a handbook to go by. Um, so I think that's overall the biggest concern is that we don't have a lot of answers um, about uh, what to do. I think right now the only thing that communities really at the very you know local municipal level can do is look at their zoning regulations if they do have zoning um, and figure out um, you know how they deal with retail operations you know any not just cannabis but just retail in general, um, how they deal with um, uh, just definitions that they have in their bylaws um, and see um, how maybe manu you know, uh, cannabis manufacturing, uh, cannabis uh, production, cultivation, um, or retail might fit within there and um, just get familiar with those um, parts of their regulations. Um, and uh, so they you know, get an idea of when the, the, the Cannabis Control Board has promulgated rules, how they'll be able to fit into that um, universe. Thank you so much. And just again, um, Gwen is the municipal policy advocate for the Vermont League of Cities and Towns, and we're so grateful you're able to be on with us. And now I want to hand it over to Seth Jensen uh, for a response to my initial question. What, what, what's on your mind? You can unmute yourself, Seth. So I think that last, okay. I think that last statement from Gwen about um, really understanding what authority towns um, and villages are going to have um, is one of the things that is uh, most on my mind. Um, you know, while the folks from Pueblo were given their presentation, um, I seemed from what I understood that there's two municipal governments, a county government and a uh, city government in Pueblo uh, with a total of um, between them 10 uh, legislative body members Seth, um, in Lamoille. Seth, sorry to interrupt. Jessica, yeah. can you um, stop your screen share, please? Thank you. Thank you. Um, in Lamoille County, there are 15 independent municipalities. Um, uh, 10 towns, five villages, and I think, unless I miscounted, 52 total select board members and village trustees. Um, so at one level, we have a very hyper-local form of government um, in Vermont. At another level, as Gwen uh, stated, um, we're what's called a Dillon's Rule state, uh, which means municipalities only have the authority that is granted to them um, by the legislature. And one of the big questions I think out there is the degree to which uh, local zoning can um, be used to regulate uh, things such as the location of um, whether it's uh, retail, um, storage, manufacturing, um, and whether uh, communities will be able to differentiate between um, cannabis-based retail or manufacturing and um, other forms, uh, you know, um, and that could go either way. I'd say that in Lamoille County, we have many of our rural communities allow uh, wood pro uh, products manufacturing in areas where general light manufacturing isn't allowed. Um, we're really having to wait to see what the legislature does and then what the Cannabis Control Board does to um, answer those questions. Um, but I'd suggest for those of you who are municipal officials uh, to be thinking about them um, anyway, um, and to be uh, thinking about how you might want to uh, fit um, the, this into your uh, local bylaws. I think one thing that is clear, and Gwen can correct me if I'm wrong or if the legislation has moved more quickly in this, is that a community will likely not be able to opt in and then use its zoning to effectively opt out. Um, beyond that, uh, there's, there's, there's a lot of questions, um, but we're definitely going to be available to help communities 
understand and navigate that those uh, issues as they come forward. Um, another issue to be thinking about, I think that the Pueblo folks talked about is advertising. Um, and advertising and signage is for anything um, municipal regulation of signage is complicated. Um, there's going to be added uh, complications to, to this, um, especially with rules related to content neutral advertising and how that applies. Um, so that's more of a question that we're going to have to be waiting for. Um, and so really what I'd be encouraging those of you who are involved with your munis municipalities to be doing is um, thinking about what types of questions uh, we should be asking, what kinds of tools you would like to have available uh, through your um, through your bylaws so that we can sort of know what to look for as um, this process unfolds. Thank you, Seth. And I was a little distracted getting into the Q&A a bit, but were, were either of you able to mention um, some of the conversations we had had previously about the, um, the charter and local tax you were able to? I, I, can, I can talk about that. So that's, yeah. a, again, um, a point Check of, um, a point of concern um, from the uh, two bodies of um, the legislature. Um, uh, the Senate um, had a 2% local option tax, which basically a community would be able to um, have uh, revenues from any um, retail establishments. The House had a version where they um, didn't have any revenues to local governments. Um, uh, and uh, obviously, um, as an advocate for local government, that was um, we were very unhappy with the House version of the uh, the bill. Um, right now, they're kind of in negotiation to figure out um, sort of a middle ground. We're not really sure where it's going to land, um, but um, it suffice it to say that um, there will likely be winners and losers when it comes to local governments. Um, it's uh, the uh, Local governments, if you don't get essentially, if you don't get um, a uh, local option tax out of this, um, there is no revenue sharing. Um, the state will keep all, all of the excise tax money um, that they're going to leverage, and communities will have to find money within their budgets to address these issues. Um, although it's not my issue, um, since this is the forum for it, um, there in the House proposal, they have um, a 30%, um, a portion of the excise tax, 30% of it, they want to put into. Uh, funding, funding substance misuse and prevention programs. Um, and so that's good in terms of, um, you know, that aspect of it, but that's not money that would go to local governments. That would just be money that goes um, distributed to um, organizations um, that deal with that. Um, so yeah, so essentially right now, um, the tax issue is, is not favorable for local governments, um, but they're going to be at the mercy of the state to basically provide the resources that they're going to need, whether it be, um, you know, whether it's law enforcement coverage, if you have, are hosting a retail establishment, but you don't have local law enforcement, um, whether it be, you know, holding local votes for whether opting in or opting out to having retail establishments, not to mention the time and energy and, um, that volunteers have to go through with updating their bylaws um, and, and such. Uh, the legislation, I'm glad that Seth brought up the advertising thing, the legislation is very prescriptive and the, 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 the legislature is, um, even the way the Cannabis Control Board, the State Cannabis Control Board is um, set up, it's very, um, uh, it's, it's very state strong and they are setting up as much of the terms as humanly possible to make it um, so local governments and communities don't have a lot of say in the matter. Um, it's, uh, and, and then therefore the Cannabis Control Board and the legislature will pretty much have all the say in pretty much everything that's going to be um, done. So um, yeah, so I, I, if you don't have a local option tax or you don't have revenue sharing, um, you're going to be reliant on your current uh, local budgets to absorb the cost, which we all know is the property tax. And if I, I may just add to that, for those of you who are um, municipal officials um, under state law currently in order to impose a uh, Local option tax, you would need to uh, go through the um, the charter development process. So that would mean uh, writing a charter, having that charter approved locally, and then having that charter reviewed and approved by the legislature. So it's it's not just a matter of the your trustees or select board 
um, taking action. So where, as sort of as we began the being prepared, um, if you are a, municipal, a municipality who is considering um, opting in and considering opting in uh, with the intention of collecting um, revenue, you would need to be doing that charter development process first. Uh, um, and you may consider timing the, the process so that the charter is in place before an opt-in happens, assuming there is a, a opt-in provision, um, because I know that's one of those things that's, uh, that, that's um, in the air. Uh, currently, I think there's three communities in Lamoille County that collect local options tax, Stowe obviously being one, um, with rooms and meals collecting a substantial amount. Um, uh, Morristown has a, a manufacturing-based local options tax, um, and then Elmore recently adopted a rooms tax, um, but of those three still would be the only one collecting a, a retail sale under current circumstances. Um, so just be aware, um, timing-wise, that, that that would be a uh, undertaking, um, especially if your community has not in the past uh, had a um a uh a local charter yeah there's only 16 uh towns and cities in the state of vermont that have a uh a local sales tax which is essentially one percent and it's really not really one percent because a community is only able to keep 70 percent of that one percent the rest of it gets sent to the state um so they really only get a fraction of it um and if the legislation that passes doesn't have an excise tax and a sales tax sort of packaged into one if they completely take out what is you know currently the sales tax if you're doing a retail transaction actually local governments might not get anything because they can really only leverage local option taxes when it has to deal with sales um, and rooms and meals. Um, so once you take that sales out of the equation, you're pretty much left with no options. So that's just an, another thing to flag. You two are so knowledgeable on this and I know with there's so much unknown. I want to, in our last uh, minutes, I know that many questions have been asked and answered in the Q&A. I encourage all participants to go to the Q&A to uh, see what's been answered there. There are also some open questions and I also want to open it to anyone who wants to uh, raise their hand and have a voice, share, share your voice and ask verbally a question at this time. There's two questions in the Q&A that Go for it. Go um, for it. Yep. first is actually going to be the same answer. Um, and that's the can communities ban shops uh, from a certain distance of schools? And is there a way for communities to opt in but use zoning to control outlet location and density? Um, the answer to that is um, we're kind of waiting for the legislature and the cannabis control board uh, to give the, the, the answer to that. Um, assuming that the full array of traditional zoning tools is allowed the way is, is for cannabis regulation, the way that you could address those two issues is by having a um, retail definition for cannabis sales that is different than general retail. Um, it's unclear right now if that's going to be allowed um, but if it was, you you could do that and have some some buffers or conditional use review, um, site plan uh, review. So those are the types of things that we'll be um, waiting for and um, you know waiting for guidance on, um, and then hopefully be able to provide further guidance uh, in in the near future. I'll just um, add to that. So the question about the using the, the zoning, um, that's, a, again, I'll agree with what Seth said, is it's a big question mark because the Cannabis Control Board, when they're promulgating their rules, um, they probably will um, do, uh, and, and again, the Cannabis Control Board doesn't have any local municipal officials on it. So it'll be interesting to see how that pans out, or at least not yet, not any designated uh, positions. But things like distances from schools, you would think that, you know, they're going to want to be mindful of that. But so that's a big question mark. It's not just, um, towns can't just do it on their own right now. Um, you have to, be, again, be granted that authority. Um, so they're basically waiting for the um, Cannabis Control Board to um, do that. It's not, um, very clear from the legislation um, if that's going to be done. And then the issue of banning shops, um, the uh, House proposal basically said that towns could um, opt in to having retail establishments, but they would have absolutely no say over 
uh, cultivation, manufacturing, any, anything other than retail, the House basically said, we only want towns to have say over the retail part of it. The Senate version says, um, we want towns to have control over all of it. Um, granted, they're going to have to opt out of it, but there is the version, in at least in both, both versions, communities will have some say. It's the Senate version just gave them more say in terms of the whole universe of um, cannabis um, uh, operations, not just retail. Um, so there will be some local say. Uh, it's just um, not sure exactly how they're going to go about it. And then um, the timing of it is also a big question mark to see how long it's going to take, you know, because it's going to take a while for the market to get up and running um, at least, you know, 18 to 24 months and how long towns are going to have to sort of like not only get their zoning up to date, but get their, um, you know, their local votes in because they're going to have to, you know, have a special um, meeting and it's going to, you know, so there's a lot to kind of prep for. Um, once the, the once the bill passes, we'll know more about what the deadlines are and what the, the dates are looking like. Um, so the uh, last thing I wanted to mention was that in both versions of the bill, um, if a town votes to allow um, establishments in their community, or not to ban them, however you want to word it, um, they cannot use their um, local ordinance authority through bylaws to essentially ban it. So they can't use their local bylaws to do something that says, um, you know, in all districts of our zoning, we're going to ban um, cannabis operations. Um, they very clearly put that in both bills that said that communities couldn't use their um, bylaws as sort of a weapon against um, placement of operations in their community if a vote already went through that to approve it. Thank you so much. I know we're at 730 and I just want to say there are some questions that ha we haven't been able to get to. Some folks lost the, had to jump in and out and are they able to get the Q&A um, uh, copied uh, for their reference and all of these pieces we will definitely be able to follow up on because we will have taped this and that will be at, um, you know, and this will also be a resource for folks moving forward. I want to take this, oh, and how many people were on? I think at some point we were around 50 hovering. I think about 70 plus people had registered. And so we are glad that, um, you know, there were so many folks who were able to join and that we can also share the information um, once we've completed this, this event. I, I really want to thank each of our can can all the folks come back on and show your face if you're there if you're there if you're able um, thank you so much to all of our panelists and presenters um, to Lamoille County Planning Commission and Seth Jensen for collaborating on this um, Brad and Sarah Scott Gwen Michelle um, I know the folks who are there who are recording um, from Green Mountain Access TV and Hardwick Community Access, Jessica Bickford and Ashley Hill, who are my dear colleagues at Healthy Lamoille Valley. And just to know, we, we really are here to help to continue the conversation, uh, support our local towns as needed, and we hope that this helps folks to uh, really be thinking now. We've got a lot of food for thought here. Um, and we will be updating our website and also uh, we have a survey that we'd love for you to fill out. So you'll receive it in an email, but I think we're also going to try to drop it into the chat box if you wanted to do it now, sooner rather than later. And we look forward to continuing this conversation, really being able to support towns. I don't know if Jessica or Ashley have any other words, but thanks so much, everybody. Thank you all.